Apologies, dear viewers of Imam Hussein TV, for that technical issue. As I mentioned, we have um, a new guest uh, on, or two new guests actually, on my socially distant uh, hot seats for, for, for today. Um, we are welcoming back Sayyid, uh, Dr. Sayyid Amman Akhshwani onto the show. He's going to be with us. Uh, but also, we're welcoming Sheikh Muhammad Al Hilli, uh, as well as Muhammad Datu, who's going to be blessing us with recitations and, of course, the wisdom uh, of Imam Al Hussein and the heroes of Karbala. So, before we get on to the speaking side, I would like to kind of shake it up a bit um, and listen to poetry, if that's okay with you, Haj Muhammad. Firstly, how are you? How's everything? Alhamdulillah, how are you keeping? Not bad, Alhamdulillah. Um, so far, so good in terms of the program. Are you guys really socially distant? No. A bit more than you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have something in between. Uh, yani, ah, so it might. A, there's a barza. It might. It might. Yeah, it might. Something <laughs> might happen. Uh, but if you want, if you want to say it, I'll, I'll just move it a bit to the side. Yeah, move, move a bit. Just we're a bit, just a bit more. Um, so yeah, Haj, and I think we were talking behind um, uh, off air <coughs> that there's a specific poem that you have. That's right. Um, care to share with us? So uh, of course we know the the famous story uh, as the scene is set that Hisham has come for Haj. And thousands have come, and as he goes to do tawaf, you know, he can't go close, he can't kiss Hajar al-Aswad. Oh. And he's angered by this, that the people haven't given him his respect as he deserves. Yeah. Mm. So he sits afar, as Shuyuk, they, they both know, I don't need to tell them, but if anyone at home doesn't know the story. And all of a sudden they see a man with a luminous face enter. Yeah. And he goes towards the Kaaba, and the people split like the Sea of Musa parts. And he goes and he does his tawaf and he kisses Hajar al-Aswad and he walks away. And you know, Hisham is angered, his, his pride has been hurt, and he knew who this was. Ajib. But out of that anger and that ignorance and that arrogance, he says, Man hadha? Mm. Who is this? And at that point, uh, a lover of Zain al Abidin by the name of Farazdaq stands up and he says, uh, Hisham, you don't know who he is? Let me tell you. you know, let me tell you, yeah. provided you don't take my life. And in <laughs> front of everyone, Hisham had to agree to this. And then on the spot, uh, this, uh, the lover of the Ahlul Bayt, Faraz Daq, stands up and gives beautiful lines of poetry, uh, which I will inshallah Please. share a few lines. Please. Um, just before I do, just to, it's in Arabic, so just a bit of a translation of what it talks about. Uh, so other than talking about who his parents are, you know, he really strikes Hisham when he says, "Hadabnu Fatimatin in kunta jahilahu." You know, he says things mm. like this to him, and then he says. Um, he says, وَلَيْسَ قَوْلُكَ مَنْ هَذَا بِضَائِرِ He doesn't matter whether you say مَنْ هَذَا Who is this? الْعُرْبُ تَعْرِفُ مَنْ أَنْكَرْتَ وَالْعَجَمُ Arabs and non-Arabs know who it is. Mm. You know, what does matter what you say? Uh, the way that Hajj al-Aswad, if it knew who was coming to kiss it, it would fall down and kiss the earth underneath this person. Um, and the line which is the most beautiful for me, he says, مَا قَالَ لَا قَدْتُ إِلَّا فِي تَشَهُدِهِ mm. He was so generous, alayhi salam, that he would never say la. If it wasn't for tashahud, he would never have said la. He only says la in ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Subhanallah. Lawla tashahudu kanat la'uhu na'amu. If it was la that even la'uhu na'amu. Na okay, okay. So would have, okay. even that would have been, would have been a yes. MashaAllah. So uh, Please. inshallah a few lines uh, with the barakat of salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allah. 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 Salli ala, ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Muhammad. يا سائلي أين حل الجود والكريم عندي بيان إذا طلابه قدم هذا الذي تعرف البطحاء وطأته والبيت يعرفه والحل والحرم هذا ابن خير عباد الله كلهم هذا التقي النقي الطاهر العالم هذا الذي تعرف البطن 
ضحى وطأته هذا الذي أحمد المختار والده صلى عليه إله ما جرى القلم لو يعلم الركن من قد جاء يلثمه لخر يلثم منه ما وطى القدم وهذا علي رسول الله والده أمست بنور هداه تحت الأمم هذا الذي عمه الطيار جعفر والمقتول حمزة ليث حبه قسم هذا الذي تعرف البطحاء وطأته هذا ابن سيدة النسوان فاطمة وابن الوصي الذي في سيفه نقم يكاد يمسكه عرفان راحته ركن الحتيم ركن الحطيم إذا ما جاء يستلم وليس قولك من هذا بظائره العرب تعرف من أنكرت والعجم إذا رأته قريش قال قائلها إلى مكارم هذا ينتهي الكرم هذا الذي تعرف البطحاء وطأته ما قال لا قادت إلا في تشهده لو التشهد كانت لا أهون عموم يستدفع السوء والبلوى بحبهم ويسترق به الإحسان والنعم مقدم بعد ذكر الله ذكرهم في كل فرض ومختوم به الكلم من يعرف الله يعرف أولوية ذا فالدين من بيت هذا ناله الأمم هذا الذي تعرف البطء حاء وطأته يا سائلي أين حل الجود والكرم عندي بيان إذا طلابه قدم هذا الذي تعرف البطحاء وطأته والبيت يعرفه وال حل والحرم هذا ابن خير عباد الله كلهم هذا التقي النقي الطاهر العالم هذا الذي تعرف البطحاء وطأته اللهم صل على محمد وال محمد I haven't heard that since 20 years ago, <laughs> Mulla Basim, yes, yes, he oh. had this and he had um, Qatsala Qalbi, yes, and he had uh, yeah, the Abel Fadl. I don't know, I forgot the, the words for Abel Fadl. Um, I'll probably remind it, remember it later. Thank you very much, no, thank you. Muhammad, uh, for that beautiful, beautiful rendition. Thank you. From one Muhammad to another Muhammad, Sheikh Muhammad Al Halli, we welcome you on our socially distant uh, hot seat. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikhna. <laughs> like the sea of Musa <laughs> parted. I worry about what things he carries. Very, very warm welcome and a special greeting to all my sisters and brothers hey. around the world nah. on this uh, wonderful, auspicious occasion. Uh, of the Wilada of these heroes of Kampala. Alhamdulillah. I grant you all their intercession. Oh. Yeah. And before I, the Ziyara in this world, inshallah, sometime soon. 
Sheikhna, there's a technical difficulty. Uh, there's a technical issue. And the technical so issue is that... Oh, people, that's why we need funding. There is no... Because we constantly have technical issues. <laughs> we plead with all no, of you to fund No, here it is. Sorry, us. the mic is right here. Uh, By the way, this man is the star behind the scenes. He's going to run away. But he is the star. There he is, there he is. So, we repeat. We repeat, as they say in Iraqi. We repeat um, once his mic is, uh, uh, is sorted. So, from one Muhammad to the other, Sheikh, <laughs> as-salamu <laughs> alaykum. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. not commented on his abaya today. He's worn specifically. The, the color this, coordination very... that you have, Sheikh. Well, I think I must admit, just because of this auspicious occasion and because of the environment and the strong wilaya that I feel, you know, the, the powerful uh, energy that I feel around me, I decided to wear this combination for the first time ever. Everton uh -huh. colors. This is an exclusive. Everton uh, colors. <laughs> you had to go there. I, See, to, I am now going to walk out of this. Well, we can't wear red, can you? Look um, the poor guys. You can't wear red. red. Can but you? That's, <laughs> that's inshallah something, something we will do another time. Um, inshallah. inshallah. But uh, wonderful to see you. Thank you very much. And it's uh, great to be here. Sheikh Nasayed um, mentioned earlier in the, in the show um, Abu Fadl Abbas usually is known from our audiences, our community, as the person who's brave, the person who's a warrior. But what we, what we underestimate is his discipline, mm. his self-control, as you were saying, Sayyid. So, Sheikh, could you um, kind of highlight and, and <clears throat> expand on, on the topic of strengthening the willpower or strengthening willpower and self-control in relation to Abdul Fadl Yes, Abbas I mean, I think what is so beautiful about these celebrations is that it's very important that we don't walk away from them without ensuring that there are some lessons or at least instigating some change in our lives. And on that basis... And because of the power of Wilaya and the impact of the Reds fans here, yeah. I've decided to dedicate about 45 <laughs> minutes <laughs> to this subject, um, inshallah yes. ta'ala, to enlighten everybody. Inshallah. I'm, 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 I'm very, very comfortable. Allah, I'm starving. Yeah. Four to five minutes. Yeah. And you heard it as 45, didn't you? Ah, uh, what a one. <laughs> so anyway. Say, Sheikh, uh, I've, I've heard that Sheikh in a wedding that you did. Yes, many years ago, years but ago. you still forgot it. It's but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. At least hey, listen, you, we have to be serious. It made okay, you all sorry, laugh. Sorry. We must be serious. We must be serious. Yes, absolutely. It's always good to be serious and also joking in these celebratory times. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. These are wonderful occasions. So we have to be um, also in a kind of spirited atmosphere. But of course, yes, definitely the discipline of Abul Fadl Abbas is something that is uh, uh, a key lesson. Now, I want to talk about it very briefly in light of temptations, because of course, oh. most of us face daily temptations when it comes to our lives, uh, wherever we go. And arguably, it could be said that in this current time, perhaps we have more temptations than people have ever, ever had. I don't know if anyone can be as bold as that, but think about it. Maybe 50, 60 years ago, there was uh, you know, much less opportunity for shaitan to impact human beings. There was always been, of course, avenues where shaitan can get into our mindsets and our souls kind of react together uh, you know, to, to impact our behavior. So we are really up against it. It's a daily struggle. It is a very difficult thing. From the moment we wake up on our phones, the way we walk in the streets and what we see, our interaction, constantly bombarded with thoughts and images. So there's a need for us to develop an understanding of how to strengthen the willpower and to say no to desires. And why Abul Fadl Abbas is such a key figure in this whole discussion is because he had a wonderful opportunity to quench his thirst mm. right at that moment where he picked up the water and felt its coldness. And I mentioned this earlier in another program, but I'll just repeat because it's likely that someone was watching this on the other program <laughs> but i'll say this that you know many times us in the i heard this i heard it oh, you heard it yeah i heard it mashallah Sayyid has an amazing opportunity uh, ability to hear two things at the same time i don't know how he heard it because he was here <laughs> said ammar is a, is a follow up i heard it i heard it Fantastic. you heard it what did i say no it was good okay <laughs> So there you go. That's why we need to have strong willpower. Hey. <laughs> so what Tell happens is what uh, I, you know, the question that somebody asked me, which is a very interesting question is, you know, in Majalis, we often say, Abul Fadl Abbas picked up the water, he felt the coldness of the water, then he threw it away. So someone asked the question, but didn't he think of Imam Al-Hussein's thirst before picking up the water to drink? 
Because why would he need to come down, pick up the water, feel the coldness, get it close, and then remember uh -huh. the daughters or, and, and, the, and the sisters and the family of Imam Hussein and then throw it away. Very ya al Hussein mm. Hold on. Why wasn't he thinking before? Mm. So it's a very interesting question. And the answer to that may be, uh, and that, that perhaps, you know, uh, here may, may generate other answers. But if imagine if he had come to the riverbank of Al-Qami, Al looked at the water and did nothing, and then just filled up the water container and then went away. Number one, there wouldn't be that stance that people would talk about. Number okay. two, he wanted to show people that he had the opportunity to drink, yeah. but he didn't. Because if it was just a matter of coming to the riverbank and then walking away, people would say he didn't really had that opportunity to drink, to be honest. Mm. I mean, he just had to quickly take the water because maybe he's surrounded by enemy combatants. There was a moment of history to be made. There is uh, one of the greatest moments of the 10th of Muharram to be established. And that is, you know, somebody who's dying of thirst. No one would have blamed him, but he threw the water that he would have needed to, um, you know, become stronger. And some people say he's a faqih. And, and so therefore he's, he did fight at Karbala. But yes. the fight was the greater jihad. the greater jihad. ascent. Absolutely. Oh, and that's exactly what we want to achieve. So he did fight. Yeah. yeah. There was that inner struggle. Mm. And he said, no. And, he, and then you see that from the lines, the poetry, when he mm, talks mm, with mm. his nafs. There was no one who talked to his nafs as much as Abu Fadl on the 10th of Muharram. 100%. You know, the constant... Who talks to his nafs when his left and right are severed? Absolutely. You know, people scream in agony. Yes. People, you know, you know, want help. But Sayed, mentioned, Fadl, Sayed mentioned, actually, to go one step further, not only was he, you know, he was actually reciting poetry, and poetry that is a lesson to be learned in this day and age. Wonderful, yeah. yes. So one thing I would like to point out in this regard oh. is people say I struggle, you know, I'm watching haram or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the constant habit of using foul language or I'm stealing or I'm doing things which are wrong. OK, so I need something in the name of Abu Fadl. I want to stop. I want to be able to kind of say no to these temptations, no to these desires, you know, help me. People are desperate. Right. One thing I would say to them is. If you want to be able to have a strong willpower to say no to moments of weakness, you have to be able to say no at moments of strength. What that means is this. If I'm in a comfortable position, if I'm enjoying myself just normally, and there is a temptation to do something which perhaps I don't necessarily need, like I'm not that tired, but I'm thinking, you know, I'm just going to go and not sleep a bit, you know, mm, mm. just lie down a bit mm. because I feel like it. That is the moment to begin that training of that muscle within known as al-irada, the will. To say, no, I'm in control, I'm not going to sleep. I'm not going to sleep. Now, this has been shown in studies. If you're able to say no at moments of mubah, which yeah. means acceptable, not halal or haram or mustahab or makru, just moments where you can begin to have assert that ability to say no to your inner inclinations and desires, you will be in a better position when you are in a, in a weaker state because you have to you know, then give up, give in because now you've said no. It's like an animal that you've tamed. It's like an animal that you've domesticated. You're in control now. You can say no easier, right? Uh, so that's, that's one way. And I can give you one more tip. Do we have time? Yes, one, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes yeah, yeah. very good. Uh, <laughs> one more tip on how to say no to temptations in the name of Abu Fadl Abbas. Mm. And that is to use a cat. C A T, cat, cat. Oh, cat. Yes. Yani bazuna. For those who don't know Arabic, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it means that which you know this individual who seemed to be uh, fabricating thousands of hadith carried under his <laughs> um, you know uh, uh, sleeves. But anyway, hey. forget that individual. Got that. Got yes. That. Uh, so the key thing is C A T. You're right. Yeah. What does it stand for, Mullah Ali? I have no clue. You're going to tell me now. Oh yes. That's called uh, counter ambush training. Yeah. Okay, that's nothing to do with going on the battlefield, but it mm. is a battlefield within. Sure, yeah, right? sure. So the key thing with this CAT method uh, is if you are in a position, like for example, you're like me, somebody who loves his what? Kletcher. Sweet. Sweets. Yeah. Kletcher, absolutely. Sweet but tooth. Because we spoke in the early programs about Kletcher, I'll speak about a cake here so that it will be <laughs> something different. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have to have a difference. Yeah. yeah. So imagine this wonderful cake here. We and need I'm to show we have some content. Yeah. <laughs>
we don't have much content, but we exactly. try to show. It's, yeah. it's, it's, you know, elaborating it. So here, I have this particular uh, cake in front of me, and right. I have this temptation to, for example, eat. If I am weak, Sheikh, or... Habib, Barakallah, it looks amazing, <laughs> but I don't know if I'm going to have any. Uh, so the key thing is, if I want to uh, uh, stop myself from eating, they say come to ambush training is more, is you come and... At that moment where there's thoughts, apparently there is dopamine released, there is these uh, you know, temptations in our minds, you walk away for 10 minutes. You walk away and do something completely different. So you ambush your thoughts, oh. you ambush your temptations by doing something which is alternative. To try and occupy that part of the brain that's telling you to do something which you don't want to do. And this example is eat that which you don't want to eat. So in that case, what happens is normally after those 10 minutes, you've gained that strength because that moment of weakness of temptation, you might give up, give in. Now, that 10 minutes gives you an extra boost to be able to kind of calm down, you know, the hormones and everything to be able to rethink, okay, shall I now go back? Chances are you won't because you're now more composed, more collected and are able to make that important decision. Ascent, Ascent, Sheikhna. Um, Sayyid, we've mentioned Imam al-Hussein, we've mentioned Abdul Fadl Abbas and the history that was made. Would any of that even be possible without the position of Imam al-Sajjad and specifically the propagating the message of Karbala? Yeah, he, I think, uh, makes sure that he doesn't just propagate the message of Karbala, he actually revamps the whole of the religion of Islam again. Mm. Religion 50 years after the Prophet had died was an absolute no man's land. You know, somehow Abu Sufyan's grandchildren are in power. Mm. And not just in power, they want to virtually finish off, even if they have to take out the Kaaba, which, you know, famously he tried to destroy the Kaaba after Karbala. And so Imam Zain al-Abideen looks at this and you see in what he produces an alternative method than direct confrontation. Even for us, when we're giving majalis, sometimes it could be direct confrontation. Sometimes you think of other methods in which you can bring people to understand Ahl al-Bayt without the direct confrontation. So we've, in my own career, I've had majalis which have been direct confrontations in reply to so-and-so who's attacked Shi'ism or Ahl al-Bayt. But then there's other angles where people have learned and been inspired by Ahl al-Bayt on a topic which is not direct Confrontation, but it's just so wonderful and such as, for example, supplications. When a person reads the supplications of Imam Zain al-Abideen, then they're like, that's the school we want to be part of. Yeah. And, and so what he does after Karbala, unfortunately, sometimes we limit him to this man who's cried his whole life. Yeah. And we don't realize that, firstly, it's not something that you'd reach the level of imama if you're just going to be someone who cries for 34 years. Absolutely. Of course, crying helps the human being grow and develop. There's a form of catharsis there, which is still studied until today. But alongside that, there's a revamp of the religion. And he does that when you look at just Dua Makarim al as an example. His great-grandfather came to establish akhlaq. He feels that after Karbala, and especially what he saw at Kufa and Sham, Akhlaq had gone. Absolutely. And, and what he feels is that there needs to be a return to what this religion was all about. We've made this religion all about who's right, who's wrong theologically, but we've forgotten the basic ethics. A three-year-old, you chain her and parade her. What happened to this religion? How is it that my younger sister was paraded in the middle of streets? I've, I need to do something about this. And so he does it through dua. And you know in his dua, by the way, it's not just... Dua is normally me calling out to my Lord. But he puts aqidah in dua. The Islamic belief system is in the duas. Really? Yeah. Because you couldn't necessarily openly elaborate on the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt like Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq do. Of course. Yeah. So he puts it in the duas in al-Sahif al sajjadiya mm. I say if you put dua makaram al-Akhlaq on one side and rasalat al-Hukuq, I think you have perfect Islam. Especially if you want to give two documents to non-Muslims. Mm, really? yeah, you want to give the Quran or you want to give Nahj al balagh I don't know, like, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you might turn around to me and say, in all honesty, Quran and Nahj al balagh I haven't finished them from cover to cover. Yeah. I've read parts of them. So how can I recommend books to people I haven't even finished from cover to cover? Mm -hmm. But 
we've all finished. And Rasalat al Hukuk is a masterpiece because he believes that the human being has disrespected themselves at Karbala with the army of Yazid and in Kufa and Sham. They've lost their humanity. It's, it's a dead, dead group of people in the Arabian Empire, in the Islamic Empire. Yeah. And so what he does with Rasalat al Hukuk, he tells you, listen, let's start with ABC again. What's God's haq on you? What's your nafs's haq on you? What's your stomach's haq on you? The only reason you killed my father is because you've got so much haram in there. What's your ears haq on you? What's your eyes haq on you? What's your private parts haq on you? Your father's haq on you, your mom's haq on you, and so on and so forth. And that document, Risalat al Hukuk, with dua makan al akhlaq, I think should be instilled into every madrasa curriculum in the Shia world. They have to literally study these two alongside the law and theology, but these two about what do I present to non-Muslims? So yes, while it was him and Imam al-Baqir, of course Imam al-Baqir was three years old at Karbala, yeah. and Sayyidah Zainab and others who survived Karbala, who made sure that we knew about Karbala, the sad thing is that we talk about him only, I think, in the context of Karbala. He had the, a whole lifetime. Yeah, and, and so those 34 years after Karbala, Majority of people are not able to talk about how one may argue Imam Zain Abidin restarted the button of Islam after his father had saved it. As you imagine his father's like saved this machine that's about to be thrown away, and Imam's now fixed the machine so that it can be used and recycled once again. Mm. If you bring Rasalat al Hukuk and Dua Makaram al together, believe you me, a non Muslim would be inspired. Absolutely. Say thank you for that, Sheikh. Thank you as well. Uh, Hajj, Muhammad Datu, we have to thank you as well, but thank also um, say goodbye to you for, this, for, for, for the moment. <laughs> and once thank again, you, you really did bring back the, the, the memories here with that poem. So thank you so much for your time. Any last words for the audience in terms uh -huh. of? Just keep it in your praise in these uh, holy nights. Ask them for donations. <laughs> you got and sweet, do sweet donations. tongue, sweet voice. Use it for donations. Ask them for donations. Inshallah. We need to pay Mullah Ali Fadl. Absolutely. So, Hajj Muhammad, thank you so much for your thank time. You very much. Um, we're going to go to a, uh, a short break. Uh, after that, we're going to be welcoming another reciter, but we're also going to be keeping Sheikh Muhammad and Sayyid Ammar uh, on the show. See you in a couple of minutes. Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom